Peter McClellan of the 401k Latte Company, and thanks for tuning in. We are privileged today to have with us Jeff Highback. Jeff is an active money manager with a company called Strategic Equity Management, and what you're about to see is a uh, just some wonderful information, wonderful data on what's going on currently in our economy with monetary policy around the world. Uh, what's going on with the stock market? Have you noticed over the summer the market's been going up? and yet the economy seems to be sort of plodding along and uh, not doing all that well, mixed, very mixed. So Jeff's going to address that and other things that are timely at this juncture in time. It's an important time. There are so many things that he'll address that are coming up yet this year as we end 2012. And um, if there's ever been a time to, to pay attention, it's now. And not just pay attention to a rising stock market. So with that, we'll turn it over to Jeff, and he'll talk about everything from quantitative easing to Ben Bernanke, the whole nine yards. I hope you enjoy this as much as we do. Did you hear about the Fed? No. What about the Fed? They announced another round of the quantitative easing. What does that mean? It means they are going to make large asset purchases via POMO. What does that mean? It means they are going to expand their balance sheet and buy treasuries. What does that mean? It means they are going to print a ton of money. So why do they call it the quantitative easing? Why don't they just call it the printing money? Because the printing money is the last refuge of failed economic empires and banana republics, and the Fed doesn't want to admit this is their only idea. So why do they want to print the money? Because they say we have the deflation, and the deflation is very bad. So what is deflating right now? The only thing deflating that I can see is the Fed's credibility. Did they have a lot of credibility to start with? No. Why not? Because the Fed has been wrong about every major economic development in the past 20 years. You mean they didn't see the internet stock bubble? No. In fact, they helped fuel the internet stock bubble. And they didn't see the housing bubble? No, in fact, they helped cause the housing bubble. And they didn't see the subprime crisis? No, in fact, they told us subprime problems were contained right before the stuff hit the fan and the Lehman went bankrupt. So has the Fed ever been right about anything? Let me see if I can think of anything. Nope, nothing. Who runs the Fed? The Fed is run by the Ben Bernanke. So what qualifies him to run the Fed? I don't know, maybe the fact that he has a nice beard. But my plumber also has a nice beard, and I would not trust him to play God with the economy. No, although when you call the plumber to fix something that is broken, they usually fix it, not break it more. This is true, the plumber is clearly smarter than the Ben Bernanke. Well, that is why he became a plumber, and not an economist. How does the Fed execute the quantitative easing? They print the money, and then they buy the treasury bonds. Do they buy the treasury bonds from the treasury department? No, they buy the treasury bonds from the Goldman Sachs. You must be kidding me. No. So let me get this straight. If I want to buy the treasury bonds with my money, I can buy them directly from the treasury. Yes. And if you want to buy the treasury bonds with your money, you can buy them from the treasury. Right. But if the Ben Bernanke wants to buy the treasury bonds using the American people's money, he does not buy them from the treasury, he buys them from the Goldman Sachs? Exactly. Who inside the Fed is responsible for the buying of the treasury bonds? The buying of the treasury bonds is conducted by the New York branch of the Federal Reserve. And who is in charge of the New York branch? The head of the New York branch is the William Dudley. And what did the William Dudley do before running the New York Fed? Before running the New York Fed, the William Dudley was a partner at the Goldman Sachs. So the guy in charge of the American people's money when dealing with the Goldman Sachs used to be a partner at the Goldman Sachs? Yes. And nobody has a problem with this? Apparently not. Is this an episode of The Twilight Zone? You are about to enter another dimension, a dimension of policies and effects, a dimension of dollars and cents. You are moving into a land where those that have failed the most in the past get the most power in the future. You just crossed over into the Bernanke Zone. Well, we certainly are entering the Bernanke zone, and you know that's a humorous look at what quantitative easing is. And I thought, with the Fed getting ready to launch another round of quantitative easing, 
we should take a look back and see, can the Fed really stop a recession? Now this isn't a new phenomenon. It's something that has happened all the way back for the last couple decades, starting with Alan Greenspan. A lot of people forget that he was the first rock star, if you will, from the Fed chairmanship. And he made the cover of Time Magazine in 1997 because everybody thought that he was able to make what they call the Goldilocks economy. And now here we have almost a decade later, Ben Bernanke makes a, the cover of Time Magazine as the person of the year. And everybody likes to say, you don't want to fight the Fed because the Fed can fight the recession. But can they really? I wanted to take a step back, starting with 1997, and look at how the Fed's tools have done in fighting the recession. So let's take a look at some of those tools. There's really five things that the Fed uses in order to fight a recession. Number one is interest rates. Number two is the money supply. And then they also have reserve requirements, the discount window, and the discount rate. Now those last three are a little bit confusing. So we want to spend a lot of time focusing just on interest rates and money supply. Not only because that's the primary tools that the Fed uses, but also because those other three tie almost directly back to what's happening with interest rates and the money supply. Now the interest rates are something that the Fed always uses to try and combat a recession by lowering interest rates to make borrowing costs much cheaper, trying to stimulate growth in the economy. They also have a tool, such as we learned in the video, of growing the money supply. And whether it's quantitative easing or just some of the other operations that they do, they think that adding excess money to the system will create a, a, an environment where there's going to be a lot more spending going on, which is supposed to stimulate the economy. So how has that worked? Let's first of all look at 1997 to 2002 and see how the Fed was able to use those tools to fight the coming recession. Now on these charts, we're looking at the year-over-year -year percentage change in the stock market, which is the red line. GDP, which is another measure of how we look at the economy, is the blue line. And then the green line is the money supply and the change that the Federal Reserve created in that, that in the monetary system. The dotted line is the interest rates. So as you can see, the Fed really was trying to grow the money supply even in the 90s when we were seeing strong economic growth. When the video talked about that they fueled the internet stock bubble, you can see both by keeping interest rates flat and actually lowering them a little bit, they did help stimulate the growth that was happening during that time. Now, what you will notice is when things started to get a little bit iffy there, they decided they needed to first start lowering interest rates and then almost soon after they started increasing the money supply. Unfortunately, it was not enough to keep the economy out of recession. The gray bar there shows the recession and as you can see, both stocks and the economy lost a significant amount of value during that time. Now let's move forward to the 2005 to 2009 period. This is the housing bubble that you know, most of you are aware of. Let's see how the Fed's, Fed tools did during that time. As you can see, once again, you saw pretty stable economic growth. You saw growth in the stock market. And you saw, in general, interest rates rising a little bit, the money supply declining just a bit. But in 2007, when it started to become apparent that things were d developing, that were going to cause problems in the financial system, the Fed first started increasing the, the rate of increase in the money supply. And then in August, I'll never forget this, because the Fed cut interest rates. And I won't forget this because that's when people started saying you can't fight the Fed. And they were right for a few months. From August to October, the, the market had a, a great time where it just went up seemingly every day. And everybody said, see, the Fed has everything under control. They're going to prevent a recession. The Fed themselves were telling us they were going to prevent a recession. Unfortunately, just like in 2000, just cutting interest rates and increasing the money supply wasn't enough. As you can see, 
as you go through the recession, both stocks and the economy lost value despite interest rates falling. In fact, interest rates got all the way down to zero before the recession was over. And money supply increased at a rate that had never before been seen in the modern era. Now let's move forward to the present day and take a look at 2009 to today. And one thing that's apparent is this is a little bit different than the past two times we've seen. Number one, we are in an economic recovery. It may not feel like it, but by definition we are. Yet interest rates have remained at zero, just like they were at in 2008. Secondly, you can see, unlike the other two periods, we're starting to see stock appreciation not tracking what's happening with the overall economy. Remember, in the past two instances, generally speaking, stock prices tracked the direction of the economy. Now this time, you could see several bubbles where stock prices got ahead and then they pulled back to what the economy was doing. The other thing I, I noticed when we look at this chart from 2000 to 2012 is the money supply continues to increase. Now, the textbook definition of, of these Fed tools are when the economy is recovering, you want to pull back the money supply. They haven't done that, yet the economic growth still is right around 2 to 2.5%. Two and, and that's something that, that should tell us that maybe there's something wrong with either our economy or the tools that the Fed is using to try to fight whatever ailments they think the economy has. To get this into perspective, it's, it's nice to look at the total period from 1997 to 2012. And there's a couple things I, I want to point out. Number one is the green line is the money supply growth. And as you can see, even though we are in an economic recovery, it has hit a point that is greater than the last two recessions. Number two is that the interest rates continue to be low. And number three, if you look at that solid blue line, which is GDP growth, you've seen each recovery have a lower and lower growth rate. You could see we were, we were able to run around 5% back in, in the 1990s. Then during the housing bubble, we were able to get to, you know, two and a half to four and a half percent. Now we're lucky to see 2.5%. So that's a, another clue that things are different this time. And what should concern us is if the Fed couldn't stop a recession the last two times, what makes us think they can pre prevent another recession? So that really makes us wonder, are the Fed policies working? And there's a couple of ways to look at it. I like to do an exercise where we use an expansion chart. And I want to first look at economic growth. On these expansion chart, the dashed line at the top is the best recovery. The dotted line at the bottom is the worst, and the solid line in the middle is the average recovery. As you can see, looking at just the economic growth, we are at a place that is worse at this point in time than we've ever seen before since World War II. It's almost as bad when we look at employment. Employment continues to track a level that we haven't seen except during the double dip recession in the early 1980s. This chart, if you look at that dashed line at the bottom, that's actually two recessions because normally employment has recovered everything about 12 months after the end of the recession. And now we're going on about 37 months since the recession officially ended, and yet we've only gained 2.5% more jobs than we had at the end of the recession. The bigger problem I see than just employment is the fact that personal income has not come anywhere close to tracking where it should have been. So when people question how anybody can say the economy is recovering, it's probably because one, job growth has been so slow, but two, because that personal income growth is the worst we've seen since World War II. And it's been very painful to people because they see the stock market rising, but their incomes are not rising. So 
why are these policies not working? That's something I really thought Ben Bernanke would be asking himself and he would be doing more speeches on. And what really concerns me is the ideas that they've had to fix the economy have been the same thing they've been trying since 2008. And they've failed to see one key concept. And we're going to look at the Federal Reserve balance sheet. The solid line at the top is the size of their balance sheet. And that's really important because you can see on that chart that we had a small quantitative easing. They weren't even calling it quantitative easing back in 2008. And then they had what was officially quantitative easing 1, followed by a short break, and then quantitative easing 2. What's important to look at is comparing the solid blue line to the dashed red line. You can see that the reserve balances that the banks held at the Federal Reserve, I like to think of them as a savings account the banks have. The banks basically were taking the money the Fed was creating and putting it on deposit with the Federal Reserve. And that means that all the money that the Fed created had been hoarded by the banks. Now, the other issue the Fed is having, and another thing why their policies aren't working, is the level of debt that both the U.S. government and households have accumulated. You can see the green line is GDP growth, and it's been growing at a very steady rate. It's actually about a 3.1% annual growth rate, going all the way back to 1947. And it, it rarely would get above or below that trend line. But if you look at beginning around 1980, both household debt and public debt started going exponential. And then by the 90s, it was going parabolic. That's a big concern because those tools the Federal Reserve are using are tools that are supposed to encourage more debt, which would encourage people to spend more money, which is supposed to get us out of a recession or get us back towards strong economic growth. But because both households and the U.S. government already had so much debt, households don't have an appetite for debt, and the, the borrowing that the federal, or the federal government keeps doing is not enough to stimulate the economy and get it into the system so people are spending money again. I will say there is a little bit of an encouraging sign if you look at that purple line, which is household debt. You can see it has declined since the recession started. So let's zoom in a little bit and see what represents that decline. This chart here shows the level of consumer debt and it breaks it out. We have mortgages, which is the orange bars. And you can see that since the peak, the level of mortgage debt has, has declined. Then you have the purple line, which is home equity loans. Those remain about the same. They, they, people are unable most of the time to take out additional home equity loans. And, but they also haven't been able to refinance those things because of what's happened to housing prices. The green is auto loans, and you can see, which is a good thing, they've declined a little bit. You look at the size of the bars. The blue lines are credit cards. Again, they've declined a little bit. The problem I see is those red bars. That is student loan debt. And you can see how small it was back in 2003. You could barely see that red square there. And then when you look at the most recent data, that totals almost a trillion dollars worth of student loan debt. Now this starts to become an issue and another problem for the Federal Reserve because as the baby boomers retire, they're going to be spending less money. In a normal cycle, if this was just a cyclical slowdown, you would see the younger families starting to pick up the consumer spending. You think of you know, the soccer moms and the football moms and all the families that are starting, how much money they spend versus a retiree. The issue we're seeing is families are being delayed because one, unemployment remains very high. The growth we're seeing in jobs are jobs that are not paying enough. And that's where it shows up in the personal income data that we talked about earlier. But number three, they have so much in student loans, they either don't feel like they can start a family or if they do, they're not spending as much. So the Fed policies are not working because we have too much debt and the banks are hoarding the money. So 
that brings us to a, a, a big issue. What can we expect the rest of the year? The markets rallied a bunch this year. And most of the rally has been based on the thought that the Federal Reserve is printing money, the European Central Bank is, is printing money, they're all buying bonds, they're creating all this money in the system. So stocks have risen. Well, the reason they've risen is because those reserve balances can be leveraged and then invested inside the stock market. Because who really, if you're a bank, wants to make a loan on a, a house for 30 years around 3% interest, when you could turn around and take that money on reserve, invest it in the stock market or the bond market, and, and make much more money than you would on, on a 30-year mortgage. So we've seen the rally in the market because of that. But like we learned in 2010, and again in 2011, and especially in 2008 and 2002, the simple fact that the Fed is cutting interest rates and they're creating money does not mean the stock market is going to be able to grow forever. If you'll recall, we've seen just since 2009 periods where the market got way ahead of the economy only to fall back down in line. Then it gets back ahead and it falls back in line. What worries me for the rest of 2012 is the market once again has gotten ahead of economic growth, yet we have a lot of things looming on the horizon. Number one, and, and it should be a concern to everybody out there, whether you have money in the stock market or not, is the so-called fiscal cliff. Now the fiscal cliff is a, a simple term trying to lump in everything that's expiring at the end of 2012 whether it's the 2001 or 2003 tax cuts, the payroll tax cut, the jobless benefits, some of the spending cuts that are going into place, the alternative minimum tax adjustments that were made over the last two years. There are just dozens of policies that are set to expire that, according to economists, are going to add up to about a 4% hit in GDP if everything's allowed to expire. And the concern we have is if Congress remains partisan the way they've been and the way they were last year when we were dealing with the debt ceiling, it's going to be very difficult to get these things resolved before the end of the year. So let's take a look at why the fiscal cliff is so important and why it's going to be difficult to address. When you look at it, it's, it's all about our budget deficit. Our budget deficit is just the amount of, of money the government has it that's either above or below what they took in, in in revenue. And as you can see, going back to the 1890s, our government pretty much always ran right around the zero line. Maybe they had a little bit of a surplus, maybe they had a, a little bit of a deficit, but they tried to keep it in line. The only two real dips that we saw until the, the, the last part of the century was World War I and World War II. But as you can see, they quickly got things back into budget and they, they paid back the money they were borrowing. But as you can see, beginning in the 70s, we started to run a budget deficit. And then, as Ronald Reagan fought the Cold War, we saw an even bigger budget deficit. The only time we've seen a surplus was in the 90s, when we had Bill Clinton working with the Republicans in, in the so-called contract with America. But as you can see, once the recession hit, we started running budget deficits that at the time were historical. And then we saw a bit of a recovery, yet we were still running a $200 billion budget deficit, even during the housing bubble. And then unfortunately, the housing bubble popped. And since that time, the deficit has swelled to $1.4 trillion. It's improved a little bit, but it's still in excess of $1.2 trillion. And it doesn't look like things are gonna get solved very soon because all the easy cuts were made last year. They cut some wasteful spending. They, they cut some areas of defense. They cut, uh, changed the rules a little bit on Medicare to make it look like they were saving some money. But when you look at the categories and the things they've cut, they haven't really cut spending overall. They continue to increase spending. This chart here shows that there's been very few times where government spending has actually dropped. Even with these spending cuts that they supposedly made, we're still seeing spending increase everywhere from 2% all the way up to 6 or 7% in the latter part of this decade. And more importantly, if you look at the red line, that's the percentage of GDP 
that the government spending represents. And you can see during the good times, back in the 90s, we were somewhere around 16 to 18% of GDP as far as government spending. But that as we go deeper into this decade, we're going to be well over 30% of all government spending in terms of, of GDP. That's, that's something that, that very few countries can, can maintain. And it's, it's an area that needs to be addressed. And we're going to look at in a little bit why those, the spending will have to continue to go up under the current budget policies. But let's look a little bit at the budget. Let's look at 2013. I decided to look at each spending category inside the president's budget and break it off into a pie chart. And it's pretty clear, I think, to anybody, even if you don't understand math, to see there's three areas, really, that represent two-thirds of the federal budget. And that's security, which includes defense, homeland security, some CIA stuff, Department of Justice, I believe. It, you know, but basically, defense is the biggest area of that. And then you have pensions, which is Social Security, as well as any government employee pensions. And then, of course, the, the big one is health care, which is the Medicare, Medicaid, and Medicare Part D, as well as a few other minor things, again, related to government pensions. Everything else, if you look off to the side, all those 0% and 1%, when a politician talks to you about wasteful spending, it, you can see that wasteful spending, while I don't like to see money wasted, doesn't add up to anything in terms of where we're spending our money. We've already made cuts to defense. That was part of the debt ceiling deal last summer. We've already made cuts to other discretionary spending and other mandatory spending. So what's left when we're trying to deal with the fiscal cliff and get our budget back into some sort of order you, you have two categories left. Another way to look at it is to look at the change in the government's budget. This chart here looks at each spending category as a percentage of GDP. And you can see there are clear drops in a couple of areas. You, as I mentioned, mandatory spending and other discretionary spending has been cut some. You can see the big drop in the, the coming years, and then it, it does level off a little bit. You can see defense, you know, the security line there, has gone down. And, and, and then we'll kind of maintain a, a flat line to about 5% of GDP, I'm sorry, below 5% of GDP, which puts us on the edge of not keeping up with some of the other superpower countries like China, Germany, Japan, and Russia. They, they tend to spend right around there as far as their GDP goes. And then the big areas I see, starting at the top, you see healthcare just continues to, to go up and, and starts to go up pretty significantly in the last part of the decade, as well as Social Security continues to climb. The other area that's climbing there is interest expense, and this is why the budget deficit matters. Because if we're unable to balance our budget, we have to borrow money. The more money we borrow, the more the people lending us money are going to expect us to pay an interest. And so as rates go up, the amount of interest is going to continue to increase. So if we can't balance the budget, we must keep borrowing money. And as you can see, that orange line, which is the interest expense, matches the amount of money we're spending on defense. That's $850 billion in 10 years that we'll be spending each and every year, and it will be going up every year after that. It won't be long after that before we're spending a trillion dollars per year just on interest. That's money leaving our economic system going somewhere else, at the same time where we've cut defense spending. This is why the budget deficit matters. It's hurting our, our future. It, it's hurting our ability to defend ourselves. Now, there's a lot more than just the fiscal cliff that the market needs to be worried about. And I, you can kind of see why I get the name Mr. Sunshine, but I, I've been just amazed how focused everybody has been on what the Federal Reserve is doing or what the European Central Bank is doing when they've tended to ignore all the other potential things that could go wrong. Obviously, we have the fiscal cliff that we, we've talked a lot about. But we also have the election coming up. And, and I think 
the election is going to tie closely to how the fiscal cliff is solved, but it's also going to be very important to how the next two years develop in our country. If we continue this divide that we saw the last two years, it's very likely that we're going to lose our AAA credit rating from the other two credit rating agencies. S&P has already said they, they likely cut our, our credit rating even more, which will then increase our borrowing costs. A lot of people ask me, well, what's going to happen if Obama wins or if Romney wins? I say that doesn't really matter because what matters is who controls Congress. So if we see this continued divide where nothing can get done, where the Senate doesn't pass a budget again, where the House can't pass a budget, we're going to be in serious jeopardy of seeing a big decline at the beginning of 2013 or even before if the rhetoric in the election gets too bad. We also are going to be dealing with the debt ceiling. If, if you recall 2011 near in, in the summer, we had major problems with in both the stock market and the bond market when they couldn't agree on what needed to be cut to raise the debt ceiling. Well, depending on whose numbers you use, we're either going to run into the debt ceiling right around the election or at best sometime in very early January, which means the new Congress is going to have to quickly decide what to do with the debt ceiling. Will they raise it again without any conditionality or are they going to raise it but only if they can get spending cuts? That becomes very important. We're also going to need to be dealing with the fact that earnings growth and economic growth has slowed down significantly since we, we started the year, yet the market is substantially higher. Again, as we showed on those, those charts, it doesn't last for very long. When market growth gets to be too high and economic growth doesn't keep up, the market tends to go back down. The European debt crisis. We've spent most of this time talking about the Federal Reserve, but most experts agree that the things they've tried in Europe this year are not permanent solutions. They're just things to kind of wait, push things back a while. Some experts are saying it only has pushed things back by about three months. Also China. China is slowing down at a very rapid pace. Now they still have strong economic growth, but when they were growing 12 or 13 percent per year and then they're only growing 7 or 8 percent, it, it hurts not only their people and their ability to, to loan money to Europe and the U.S. Now China is one of the biggest purchasers of our debt. It also hurts as far as any companies that do business over in China or relying on that, that type of um, growth over there. And then finally, we have the Middle East conflict. We, we saw the violence pick up again in, in Libya and Egypt. We have Syria, which is just a powder keg. We, we have rumors now that Iran and Russia are helping the side that we oppose. And if, if things get too ugly there, who knows? I mean, who knows what's going to happen? You know, you, Russia claims to be our friend, but yet we just still can't trust them. Maybe it's because I'm a child of the 80s, but it, it always worries me when you see Russia on the other side of, of, that we're on. And then, of course, you have Iran and Israel. There's still rumors that Israel wants to strike Iran before the election because it would force the president to help them. If it's after he's been elected, and, and he's still in office, Israel feels like maybe he would not support their mission to Iran to try to prevent them from getting nuclear weapons. So how can strategic equity help you handle some of this uncertainty and the, the certain volatility that we're going to see inside the stock market? There's one thing you have to understand. Strategic equity has been around for 20 years. We've seen stock prices go up, we've seen stock prices go down. We already talked about two examples where the Fed was unable to stop a bear market and a recession. We've lived through that. We've managed money through that. And we've come out stronger on the other side because of that risk management. Something that's really important in your portfolio is to deal with how it is positioned. Too many people for too many years have been focusing on you got to buy and hold stocks for the long run. That's left a lot of people exposed to the stock market when they really couldn't afford it. I recently was, was looking at what they call the target funds. And now they have these for target retirement, but they also have them for 529 plans. And I have six kids 
And I was just astonished with how these target funds were invested. And, and what really blew me away was my son, who's a, a junior in high school, and is going to be needing his start tapping his college fund in three years. Based on this high school graduation date, this fund family's target fund had 30% of his portfolio invested in stocks. Now there's one thing we know based on history. Just before and during a recession, which we know that we're obviously going to have another recession probably in the next seven years before he graduates from college, the market goes down on average 40%. So if you have 30% of your money in these target funds invested in an asset class that could lose 40%, that's already a 12% hit to his college fund. That's something we can't afford. So it's really important to look at your investment period. Meet with your financial advisor. And focus first, do I have a budget? Do I have my insurance needs taken care of? Have I paid down my debt? And then start filling down your pyramid. You need to take care of your short-term needs. Some people have such a low risk tolerance that they may have all their money in, in short and mid-term type investments. Very few people should have a significant amount of their money invested in the stock market. And that's something where a good financial planner can really help you. That's the key driver to getting through these uncertain times. But there's a couple other things that strategic equity does. Number one is we use mechanical systems that are engineered to try to go get rid of all the noise all this fundamental stuff we were talking about, we want systems that just look at the data inside the market and invest according to what the probabilities say are either gains in the market or losses in the market. There's a lot of times where these statistics coming out of the market say, you know, based on historical data, this is a risky time to invest. So our systems by design will tell us to get out. It, they don't care what Ben Bernanke does. They don't care what's happening in Europe. They just want to look at the raw data coming out of the market. Another way that strategic equity can, can help our clients is by removing the emotion from their portfolios. There's a company called Dalbar that studies investor behavior. And I've always found these studies fascinating. And this has been true whether it was the 1990s tech bubble, the real estate bubble, or, or where we're at today. Is most investors do not achieve the gains that mutual funds state because what do they do? When the market goes up a bunch, they decide, you know what, I should buy more of XYZ fund. But then when it starts to go down, like we saw the 50% drop in 2008, most people end up selling. So they don't get to enjoy the 9% return the S&P 500 had. Instead, the average growth investor has only earned 3.8% going back the last 20 years. They call that the irrational behavior gap, and that's something, having our mechanical system, having you fill out that pyramid from the top down, and not having too much money exposed to areas of the market that you can't afford to be exposed to, allows you to miss behaving irrationally. The other thing that we're really trying to do with strategic equity is to keep the losses as low as possible. Now there's something you know they call the mathematics of losses and that's illustrated on this chart and you have to understand when you lose money you have that much less money to make it back up on, on the upside. So one of the things, I, I, the easiest example to understand is if you lose half your portfolio value you don't have to make 50% to get back to break even. You have to double your money, which is a 100% return off the bottom. And the other thing I notice in this chart is there's a point where it starts to curve up so high that the losses that you get become more and more costly in terms of how much risk you have to take to make the money back. So by using our mechanical approach, we try to keep those losses in the range that can be made up easily with average market returns. There is, however, a problem with active management. And this is something that those of you that have been around active management may understand, is that I guarantee you active management will not keep up with the S&P 500. 
I also guarantee you that a lot of people want to compare whatever they're invested in to the S&P 500. Now it's important to understand, the reason we can't keep up with the S&P 500, and the only way you can, is if you invest in the S&P 500 the entire time period, which means you're going to own all the gains, but you're also going to own all the losses. So a big mistake that people make with active management is to compare our returns to the S&P 500. Now we pulled out our most popular fund. Um, it's most popular because most of our clients tend to be age 50 and older. So when you imagine that investment pyramid, they tend to be near the top of that. So they have a lot of short-term money. They also have a, money, a lot of money that they don't want to take a lot of risks on. This is our income allocator program going back to 1998, which is the year I started with strategic equity. And I find it interesting that nine of the 14 years I've been with strategic equity, we've underperformed the S&P 500. I'm proud of that. And you might say, well, why, why would you be proud of, of underperforming more often than, than you outperform? I'm proud of it because if you look at the bottom, the total return of 191% versus that 67% number for the S&P 500, that shows that we did our job. Our job is not to capture all of the upside in the market. Our job is to keep the losses at a level where you're not going to be shooting yourself in the foot. You're not going to be acting irrationally because you lost so much money. So while it may be frustrating when the S&P 500 beats whatever it is we're doing, the real value in active management comes during those uncertain times like we're probably facing. You know, when we deal with the fiscal cliff, when we deal with the debt problems, when we deal with whatever's going to happen again in Europe. That's where we add our value. Now I want to close today by, by gaining a little perspective on, on where we're at. Again, we just talked about the last 14 years for the stock market. And there's something that, that people don't understand. The market has gone up to around 1500 on the S&P 500, and then it lost half its value. Then it went up again, around 1500, and then it lost half its value. Now it's been climbing back up again. And the issue I have is that for 14 years, the market's been going through this cycle. They call that a secular bear market. Now, I don't know if this cycle's gonna continue, but what I do know is as we showed from all those charts, the stock market basically tracks economic growth. All the things that our economy is facing tells us that the stock market is not going to be able to grow because the economy is not going to be able to grow. Now we're getting to a point where we're 5 or 6% away from that 1500 level again. That could be the point where everybody begins to realize. That might be when the fiscal cliff finally starts hitting the front pages. That's when investors might start to panic because they don't know what their taxes are going to be. Likely we're going to see businesses stop spending money in the latter half of this year until this whole situation is re resolved. We've sort of set the recipe for huge declines in the market once again. Now I hope I'm wrong. I, I hope that somehow both sides come together and we fix it. We come up with a budget solution and things can, can keep going. That would be great because we're actually right now, as, as Peter likes to say, we're at the party. We have money invested in, in both our bond programs and our stock programs. We're pretty heavily invested right now. The difference is we have systems that are looking to get out at any time. At, at signs of, of danger. These things are designed to start stepping out of the market. Now, they're not going to be perfect. They're going to endure some losses, of course, when the market first starts going down. But the key, if you think back to that mathematics of losses, is we need to minimize those losses as much as possible because there's going to be opportunities on the other side, and that's what we're trying to play for.